morning, everyone, and welcome to today's PHO webinar presentation on engaging fathers in home visiting. My name is Monica Nunez, and I am a Knowledge Exchange Specialist at Public Health Ontario. I have the pleasure of co-moderating today's session. Before we begin, I'll mention a few housekeeping items. To enhance the presentation experience, participant audio video has been disabled. The chat pod has also been disabled to limit any distractions during the presentation. Please use the Q&A pod if you have questions during the session. A discussion and question period will also follow the presentation. If at any point during the session, you experience any technical issues, please email capacitybuilding at oahpp.ca. I would now like to introduce my co-moderator for today, Sonia Strom. Sonia Strom is a program manager in the School of Nursing at McMaster University. As part of her role, Sonia contributes to the development and revisions of nurse family partnership program materials, manages oversight of the provincial NCAST PCI instructor education and training program, and manages PHN prep program activities, including resource development and engagement and program evaluation continuous quality improvement projects, and research. I'd now like to pass it over to Sonia. Good morning. Thank you, Monica. I'm thrilled to be here today co-moderating with yourself and representing the work of the PHN prep team in supporting PHNs, supervisors, managers, and home visiting staff in their work with families. Today's presentation will focus on exploring the various patterns of paternal engagement and participation in home visitation programs, as well as strategies and approaches that home visitation programs can employ to tailor their services and enhance father engagement. So it is now my pleasure to introduce the speaker for today's presentation, Dr. Susan Jack. Dr. Susan Jack is a professor in the School of Nursing at McMaster University. As a leader in public health nursing practice, education and research, her work focuses on the development and evaluation of interventions to improve maternal, infant and family health outcomes. As the lead of the Public Health Nursing Practice Research and Education Program, or PHN PrEP, she is committed to advancing public health nursing practice and education. Um, and it is my honor to work with her on a daily basis. So I'm going to pass it over now to Sue. Great, uh, thank you, Monica. Thank you, Sonia. Um, hello, everyone. Happy New Year. I don't know, for me, um, September always feels like a, a new year. And so um, this is our, our, to me, the first of our new series of webinars um, over the next few months from now until next June. Um, so welcome to everyone. And uh, today we're gonna be talking about fathers and home visiting. And um, I can't believe and, um, that it was over 21 years ago uh, that my husband, uh, Rich and I, uh, that we brought home uh, our twins and they were late uh, preterm twins. Um, I had uh, a C-section. Uh, one of them ended up with a short stay in the NICU. That same one was tongue tied and um, when we finally came home, we also came home to having no family support because at the time, all of our family lived in Alberta. Now, uh, a few weeks ago when I was presenting these slides, um, every day, my husband and I take our dogs for a walk in the evening and that's sort of our time to reflect on the whole day. And I said to him, I said, do you remember a public health nurse coming to visit us when the boys were born? And without even hesitation, he goes, yeah, I remember when Faye came, he remembered her name and, and he goes, that was great. And I said, okay, as a qualitative researcher, help me to understand why you say the visit from Faye, our public health nurse, uh, was great. And he said, you know what, she walked in and she just brought an essence of calm. And he said, you know, she provided some really practical information because at the time the boys were asleep in these car seats by the couch. And he said immediately in a really non-judgmental way, she talked to him about, you know, safe sleeping and that for premature infants, why it might not be the best option to have them napping or sleeping in their car seats. And, um, and then she, he says, I so remember her so clearly asking him 
what are some of the main challenges or concerns that you have in this period? And he was really, he tells me now, he was really open and forthright with her. Um, and he goes, you need to help us and, and you need to talk to Susan. And at the time, my last job before I went on, because um, um, I was on bed rest for a long time and in school, but my last job um, before having the boys uh, was I was an HBHC manager. And before that, I was a public health nurse. And so many of you can appreciate that my mindset was, um, I am going to breastfeed on demand these premature twins. And by the time Faye showed up, I don't think I had slept for maybe mm, three or four days. And one of them was tongue tied. And so Rich said, you really need to help us. And he said, I just remember how gracious she was in, in asking for him what was the concern and then talking to him and coming up with solutions and really essentially saying, you know what, let's find a schedule that works for your whole family and let's get pumping going. And it's, it's, you know, and her saying to me, Susan, it's not going to kill the babies to give them a bottle at 5 p.m. so that you can get four hours of sleep between feeds. And she said, I know you're thinking on demand, but you need to get them on a schedule if you're to survive with twins. And the other thing that Rich remembers her saying is that she said, okay, let's talk about your role and what's something that you can do unique that's just you, dad, with your babies. And so they talked about bath time. And she said, why don't you make that your thing? Because that can be then time that Susan can go clean the kitchen or go for a walk or have a nap. But that will be a time where you and your boys, you know, can just have that time together, bath and bedtime and doing that whole routine. And I loved hearing this story from Rich. And in reflecting on it, I recognized that when Faye came into our home as a public health nurse, um, she immediately engaged the father. She spoke to him directly and asked him what were his concerns. And she gave information that was relevant and practical. And she gave information that not was only that was not only of benefit for my health and the, the children's health, but that also really supported our relationship as new parents. And it was just a reminder to me of how important it is to engage everyone in home visiting. So, you know, in thinking about this topic today, I also wanted to start with a definition of family. So I went to the internet and that's not an easy thing. I had no idea that there are census definitions of families, that there are economic definitions, that there's legal definitions, that there's social anthropologic definitions of families. And then, of course, there's all the definitions of family that it's, you know, whoever you choose to have as a support or person in your life. Um, so I don't have a definition of family. But what I do want to acknowledge is that all of you in your work and in your roles and with the colleagues that you work with, um, that we all recognize that families really vary in size, in function, in structure, and in composition. And all of you will have worked with or supported a diversity of families, single parents, uh, children living with foster parents or grandparents. Uh, you will have worked with families where there's two mothers or where there's two fathers. And many of you will have worked with families where there is a mother and an individual who identifies as a partner as a father or as a father. And it is within this webinar, it is within that context that we're going to be speaking about today. So I will be using the language of father and, and partner and thinking about that context. And to start that conversation in our short time together, I'm going to highlight what we know about the benefits of engaging fathers in home visiting, describe again what we know about the characteristics of father participation in home visits, and then start to uh, share with you what are some of the strategies grounded in the evidence um, or best practices around tailoring home visiting for fathers. So the first thing that I think is really critical that we start with is really recognizing um, that in the body of literature that focuses on the relationship between fathers and children's health outcomes, it is evident that the presence of a father um, can critically influence a child's health, growth, and development. And it can influence it um, either positively or negatively, depending on um, 
the nature or characteristics of the father's involvement um, with the mother or with the child. And so what do I mean by that? You know, so when you can see here that when fathers are positively involved in the family unit and, and positively involved with the child, that it results in um, an increased likelihood of positive uh, child development outcomes. And when I say positive fathering behaviors, in the literature, those are, are things like, you know, fathers who exhibit warmth um, and responsiveness to the child, where they're engaged in a relationship with their partner, with, with the mother, um, where there is respect um, and equality. Uh, where the father uses uh, positive or sensitive approaches to parenting, where there's encouragement, where they have the knowledge and skills to um, read and understand and interpret an infant's cues. And there's a significant amount of literature that talks about, you know, that fathers who are positively involved, that those are individuals who provide indirect care. So they're providing, for example, economic resources to the family unit, that they're involved in the direct care of the infant. So, you know, feeding, playing, dressing, bathing, and that they're also engaged in the process responsibilities. So those would be fathers or individuals who take the initiative to say, okay, I'm going to um, search for, arrange, um, and get our child to childcare um, and school. So those are examples of being positively involved. In contrast, um, the literature also identifies that if there is a father, father figure or partner um, who is negatively involved with either the mother or with the child, then that increases um, the likelihood or risk for the child uh, to develop things like conduct disorders, aggressive behaviors, disruptive behaviors, um, and both internalizing and, and externalizing um, uh, behaviors. And again, examples of a father being negatively involved would be a father who engages in harsh parenting uh, techniques, um, who rejects the child, um, or where there is neglect or other forms of child maltreatment. So impor important for us to take this balanced approach um, but on balance, the research does suggest that fathers should be viewed as a, as a resource for improved uh, family functioning. So, you know, in preparing for this, I was like, okay, well, how many fathers are actually um, involved in home visiting program? And I was surprised that not a lot of people are doing research in this area. There are some researchers with home visiting programs in the U.S., um, but that's really the only country where there's a small sample really looking at um, this population. And I thought, okay, that makes sense because for the most part, most home visiting programs um, screen or enroll uh, the mother or the individual that gives birth, or if it's an adoptive family, a primary caregiver is identified. Uh, but typically it's that individual who is enrolled, becomes the index client, in the home visitation program. And historically, the focus of many um, home visiting programs has been on uh, promoting um, pregnancy, maternal and child health outcomes. And while I say that, I also know that many home visitation programs talk about or have language um, or some resources where they say we value the engagement of partners and fathers or other family members in home visiting. Um, so there's that language that says we value the engagement of others. Um, so when I start to look at the data, um, most studies typically report that father participation in home visiting is actually quite low. And that when there are non-resident fathers or fathers who are not married uh, to the child's mother, they are even less likely to participate. So I went back and also looked at some of our data. Um, I led a process evaluation of the implementation and delivery of the Nurse Family Partnership Program in BC. Uh, this was a five-year study where we um, uh, collected data and tracked the implementation of the NFP Home Visitation Program. And in looking at that data across three phases of the program, pregnancy, infancy, and toddlerhood, on average, um, in about one in five home visits, and often families, they can receive up to about um, 50 to 64 home visits across those three time periods uh, that that there was really in, yeah, in one in five home visits was it identified that a partner or a father was also participating. 
Um, so certainly uh, the, the, you know, the minority of home visits was there someone else. And um, in the same study, in this process evaluation, uh, we collected um, substantive qualitative data from the nurses delivering the program. And in some of our interviews and focus groups, we, um, we focused in on trying to understand uh, what father participation and engagement looked like. And we quickly learned that um, that it's really that there's different patterns that nurses described um, that it's really important for us to distinguish between uh, when someone is participating in a home visit versus when someone is engaged in the work of home visiting. And through our analysis of this data from um, the nurses experiences in home visiting program, um, we were able to identify that there's four unique patterns of how fathers engage and participate in home visiting. Um, so the first pattern is where the nurses described um, that the partner or the father is physically present in the home visit and really engaged. And when we said, what does that mean? They're like, they're there, they're asking the nurse questions, um, that they're showing that they're aware and knowledgeable of the infant's routine. Um, they, have, they have questions on what to do do? How can they support their partner? They're knowledgeable about their infant's milestones. And the nurses said they perceived that uh, the mother was uh, pleased and comfortable uh, that her partner was engaged in that, that home visit. Then the nurses said, we also have um, fathers or partners that even though they're not present, they're also engaged. And what they meant is that there was a lot of partners or presence because of um, partners, um, because of the timing of the visits, were not able to be at the home visit because they were at work or they were at school or they were away. Um, but the nurses said, we knew they were still engaged because sometimes the mother would say, my partner would like to know, or my partner asked me to ask you, or the partner would leave some notes um, or would text the nurse. So the nurse said, even though he's not here, we know he's engaged and interested in receiving some information and support. Then as we go to the last column, the nurse said, well, also in this program, there's many families where there's, there's not a partner, there's not a father of baby that is um, involved in the relationship. And they said, you know, we visit many, many families where um, there's just, there's just not a partner in to, you know, around to be involved in the visits. And they said, in those cases, we always encourage the mother, you know, does she have a friend or a grandmother or someone else she'd like to, um, to involve. But there was this third category, and this is the one where the nurses said, this is the category that um, that we worry about or that we think about or we, we walk very cautiously about. And they described this pattern of where the father was physically present. And in the interviews with nurses, they said, this is often the father who we can see him sitting in the kitchen watching us, or you know, he's in um, a corner um, in a chair playing video games, or he's sitting on the couch and not talking to the nurse or engaging, but looking at the mother um, and watching what she says. And increasingly the nurses would talk about also the fathers who required the uh, mother to call them on their phone so that he could watch the home visit, uh, like by FaceTime or a video chat. And the nurses said, you know, we tried to get it, how do you know? um that you know that these are fathers who are present but not engaged and they said we just have a sense that in some of these home visits that the the partner is there not to be involved in learning about child development or parenting that really the nurses said we have a sense that there are some fathers that their primary reason for being physically present by either by phone or in the room or by the room is one of surveillance. And the nurses said, we just get the sense that it's about power and control. That partner is there to ensure that the mother does not say thing, anything out of line. And um, this, this last category could be a whole other, a whole other webinar. Um, but I just wanna highlight it here that if you ever have that sense, my recommendation would be, that would be a situation where as a nurse, I would go, okay, I'm seeing some behaviors here um, that are of concern for me and I need to really figure out what's going on. And that might be a case where I would personally initiate an indicator-based assessment um, for intimate partner violence to get the mother 
um, alone and have an opportunity to ask her some questions about her sense of safety um, and her level of confidence um, around confidence or sense of safety around having her partner involved in the home visits. So I've just put that one there as a little, a little caution. And just to recognize that as we develop programs and innovations in your home visiting program, um, not all individuals are the same and we really need to start thinking about different aspects or patterns in the populations we serve and how important it is to tailor our programs uh, to different populations. And so, but if we think about those top two categories, if we go back and focus on um, the fathers who are engaged, whether they're present or not, um, what do we know about the benefits of engaging those fathers? And um, so what the literature suggests is that uh, when fathers safely engage in home visiting program, there are important documented benefits. One of the key ones that is consistently reported is that it improves family and maternal retention in home visiting programs, which is a huge issue for many home visiting programs about the ability uh, to retain families. Um, mothers report that when fathers are involved in home visiting that they do mothers report that they see increased fathers emotional involvement in parenting practices and that it also creates increased opportunities for improved child well-being by supporting fathers to develop their own knowledge and skills related to different parenting practices. Um, so we do see that there's some important benefits when we can safely engage fathers. Okay, so as we start to think about, you know, what are some really simple things that we can do? Because I really appreciate um, most community based organizations and health units right now are under a lot of stress and pressure. There's not a lot of resources to make huge programmatic changes. So I always want to be really practical um, in the advice and guidance that we promote. And the, what I'm going to share with you today are really some best practices for home visiting programs that have been developed um, uh, by the National Home Visiting um, Center in the United States. Um, as well as from the National Responsible Fatherhood Clearing a Clearing House. So the first thing to, in an organization is, you know, even to start to think about anytime you're having meetings or reviewing policy and procedures, uh, to think about father or partner engagement and how do we foster that that culture of father engagement. And so that can be as simple as, you know, when on your intake lines um, or at any group settings or even at front desks, um, are staff aware of intentionally welcoming and engaging and serving fathers? Um, when you're developing policies, is there someone there saying, okay, have we gone through this policy and are we considering the role of fathers or fathers' needs or partners' needs? And in one-on-one -on -one, uh, service delivery, when we start to create an organizational culture that values father engagement, I always think, you know, and again, many of you know that I do my work from a trauma and violence informed care lens and that language matters and small changes in how we talk to or talk about individuals that we serve make makes a difference. So, you know, are you able to um, use language that tells fathers that their participation is is valued and welcomed. So you know maybe that first contact when you're, um, for example, when doing screening, postpartum screening in the hospital, or that first phone call or that first home visit. Um, you know, do you take the time to um, ask the partner there how would they like to be addressed? Uh, what is their name? Um, what are they calling themselves? What is their role? Are they papa? Are they dad? Um, are they father? Are they partner? You know, how are they asking to be identified to their their child? And taking the time to explore how they would like to participate. The key here too is also um, building on those examples I've given is really to think about engaging fathers um, early. And, you know, so that means it's really important that fathers understand that services are for all parents and all caregivers, and that their really unique and distinct roles in their child's life are valued. And so look at your communication um, from your organization. Does it include um, language um, and graphics that represent all types of families, including families with fathers. And um, 
continuously seek to engage because so i've really given you some examples about early engagement you know making sure they feel welcomed and valued when they first approach asking them them their name how they want to be identified uh, but i think you know this is a situation where at first if you don't succeed it's important to try and try again because it's important to remember that many fathers um, or partners may themselves have had negative experiences with health or social care systems, um, and they may be very ambivalent about your engagement in the family and trying to figure out what are you doing here? What's your role? What are the risks of you uh, coming into our home? And many years ago, gosh, it was probably about 1999, I, I, I had the privilege um, to collect all my data for my PhD at Middlesex London Health Unit and was interviewing mothers and fathers about their engagement in home visiting. And I remember interviewing a small sample of fathers. And it was some of the first times I heard fathers say, you know, the country that I come from, when someone from the government comes and knocks at your door, you don't automatically trust them. And it made me realize for the first time that as nurses or home visitors, we might be perceived as agents of the state. So they're saying, we don't know what you want. And other fathers would say, who are you to tell me? how to parent. So there was this fear of judgment. So it's important to, rec to remember that, you know, we need to do our best to engage and welcome fathers, but that when we experience ambivalence or resistance or hesitation, we don't give up or we back off. We seek to understand what's underneath that resistance and ambivalence, and we keep trying and trying again. And then what organizational, you know, always to ensure that there's supports for staff and resources and tools available for staff to use um, to help engage fathers. Okay, so what, is, what does that look like? If we're going to start to make some small changes, um, are all forms of communication inclusive from your organization when there is more than one parent or caregiver? Um, you know, when we're first connecting with clients or families, whether it's in hospital or on a first phone call on our first home visit, is there something on the form that guides the home visitor or the clinician or the service provider to say, um, who else should we be reaching out to? Is everyone that you want to be participating in the home visit here? And if they're not here, what's their name? What's their role? Uh, what is their contact information? And I, I appreciate that all of you will do this work within the rules and boundaries of privacy and confidentiality that are set out by your organizations. And another, and I, I say small change, but then I shake my head and know that anytime you try to change an assessment form, um, that that's a lot of work, then you have to change the policy, and then you have to change something in the ISCUS fields or, you know, your EMRs. Um, but for long term planning, um, do you have care pathways or tools or resources that you can use to assess the needs of fathers? Um, so, for example, um, in many agencies, um, the mental health needs or risks of mothers are often um, assessed for um, or screened for. Do you have pathways that also say that it's important to screen or assess or ask about um, the father or the partner's mental health in the perinatal period? Uh, many webinars ago, we talked about um, the value um, and the benefits of completing life history timelines to start to get to know your clients, to develop a relationship, um, and the value of life history timelines and being able to identify uh, histories of past trauma or adverse childhood experiences. Those aren't just for the mother. Um, those that's a great opportunity to involve the father in completing that tool as well. And particularly in my work with nurse family partnership, which is tailored towards uh, young parents and young parents experiencing social and economic disadvantage. Um, anecdotally, nurses have shared that when they have the father of the baby or the partner complete the life history timeline, that the mother and father actually learn a lot about each other. It's not just about the service provider learning about them as assessment data, but in that interaction, the partners are learning new things about each other. Um, so look at your assessment tools, look at your care pathways. Um, are there ways to integrate ways to collect data and document data from fathers and partners? 
And that also leads to goal setting. You know, when you have your goal setting forms, you're identifying priorities. Are you asking what are the goals of the mother? What are the goals of the father? And what are the goals if they're a couple? What are the what are the relational goals as well together? Um, and are your program materials father friendly? And again, does messaging include fathers? Um, do your materials reflect the diversity of all families? And are your spaces welcoming to all families? So small, hopefully simple things. And again, I should avoid saying simple, but things to think about that can be changed within programming. And then if we, those are you know, some broader um, strategies that require engagement with the organization. But many of you do most of your work with one on one, either uh, with individuals in a home visit or over a phone call or over zoom. Some of you work in group settings, um, parenting classes, you know, um, the early on centers. So when you're working one on one with families, what are some of the strategies that you can make sure um, that you engage in. Um, so specifically again invite fathers make sure that they know that they are welcome. There will be situations, this is where you use your critical thinking skills where you may go oh i'm going to first check in with the mother or you know the. Um, the mother whoever's the index client to say i'm just going to check in to see if she's comfortable or safe having the other person in. you always have to do that assessment, um, but if so a uh, specifically invite them don't just make an assumption that they're going to show up if they're interested because again many health and social care environments have been typically developed for women and many men may feel that that's not a welcoming space for them or not the place for them uh, to be engaged um, explain the benefits to families of father participation why this can be a value um, to the father to the relationship to the child's development um, as well as to the mother and provide anticipatory guidance. And again, that means telling people what they can expect. And again, if we know that the literature says that some fathers are ambivalent or hesitant to engage, um, to start to understand or you know um, address some of that resistance, the strategy that we can do is to say, here's the purpose of a home visit, or here's the purpose of our services. This is how long they last. Um, we're going to focus on these topics. It is it is about you. It should be client led, person led. I'm interested in understanding what are your goals, what are your needs, and my goal is to come here to bring information and supports and resources to support you in addressing your needs. So we just may assume people know that, uh, but I think it's beneficial up front to always tell people who we are, what we're going to do, why we're doing it who we're going to share this information with and why it's important. Provide that anticipatory guidance and genuinely include the fathers in the visit and the conversation. There is qualitative evidence that suggests that many service providers tend to directly ask questions to mothers and to look at them. And when they've interviewed fathers, um, the fathers conversely have said when I see a service provider only looking at the mother only asking those questions. Um, it seems to imply that she should lead the conversation that she should respond and that I don't really have a place to interject. So that's on us right that that's it's on us to ensure that we're looking at everyone who's present in the home visiting asking all of them, what are their concerns, what are their needs, what are their different thoughts. Um, and, you know, part of uh, particularly um, within the scope of nursing practice, you know, that creates opportunities for um, if you have opportunities for professional development in family communication or circular communication, you know, because, uh, you know, how do you ask people different perspectives and get individuals uh, to hear different perspectives and to respond, uh, because communication can be tricky when there's multiple people sharing multiple perspectives, but the important message is find ways to genuinely include the fathers or the partners in the visit and in the conversation. And in thinking about that second group, the fathers who are engaged but who are not present, what are some ways that you can follow up and connect with them if they're not there? Um, can you leave a sticky note or leave a little note? Is there, does your um, health unit or uh, program organization have books um, or something that you can leave at the home specifically for the father for them to read to their child. Um, you know, if you've identified that there's alternate ways to communicate, 
Can you send a text message or say to the father, if you have questions, feel free to text me. Um, and we're always cautious of safety. I always think work from safety first. There may be times where we may say to the dad, now that we have this great world of hybrid home visiting, um, you know what, if you ever just have some questions, why don't we set up a Zoom call or a, a Google Meet or a Teams call or whatever technology you use and do a hybrid home visit just with a father um, to answer some of their questions. So different ways to think about how we can use our technology to connect with those fathers who want to be engaged but can't be physically present. Okay. Um, so be flexible and be inclusive on those first few visits ask and consider what is the father's work or school schedule. Is it possible within your own schedule to mutually negotiate some times that you connect either in person or again using hybrid technology. Do you know yourself as a clinician, a home visitor, or service provider, what are the community resources available for fathers in your community? So much of our practice is about warm referrals. And if we have opportunities to begin to identify what are fathers' concerns, um, if we're assessing for their perinatal, um, their mental health concern, their mental health within the perinatal period, do you know what are the resources available to support fathers? in your family. Most organizations, everyone has a really good hand on the organizations and supports for mothers and children. But maybe this is some option for team meetings to start to take a look around your community and say, what's available for fathers? Do we have that information? Do we need to go do a site visit so that we can provide fathers with anticipatory guidance if we give them a referral or a warm referral to those services? And do you also have facilitators or activities where if a father is physically present that you can engage them in a hands on activity. So that early example of a life history timeline would be a hands on activity where I as a public health nurse would be engaging the father in an activity um, in a home visit. Okay. And finally, the last thing I just want to share is that those are practical strategies, but what is at the heart of every encounter or every home visit is the therapeutic relationship. And I think it's always critical for us to remember that. And so that in addition to being respectful and warm and welcoming, that as part of that relationship with partners or fathers, that we really seek to understand where they're coming from. What is their understanding of our role into the home? That we seek to understand what have their past experiences been like? It might explain a lot of their behavior that we might see um, either towards us or towards their family and to really explore their experiences um, without, without judgment and that we find ways to celebrate their role, um, that we find ways to share information on their unique transition to the role of father. Are there ways to celebrate things like Father's Day within your organization? Um, and most importantly, that we take some time to identify and acknowledge the father's strengths and to share those with him reflect them back to reflect back to um, his his partner as well and then talk about how we can build on those strengths uh, to promote those safe and sensitive uh, parenting practices um, so i'm gonna i'm gonna stop uh, there. Um, I know we're going to, um, I'm going to hand it over in just a minute to Sonia for, for Q and A, but I just want to highlight too that, um, uh, please save these dates for our upcoming webinars for this new year. Again, new year for me starts in September. We're going to be focusing our theme this year is around uh, celebrating and embracing the diversity of families that you work with. And in October, uh, we're going to have a guest speaker come and talk about um, working with families um, with disabilities in pregnancy and perinatal period. In November, we're gonna have another amazing speaker who's gonna come and talk about our work with racialized families. In December, another amazing speakers who are gonna come and talk about um, how can home visitors work with parents um, who are neurodiverse. Um, so lots of exciting webinars uh, coming up. Um, so I will stop there and turn it back to you, Sonia. Thank you so much, Susan. Wow, this really brought me back to when I was 
pregnant and a new mom and thinking about some of those simple ways, I, simple, but they do need to be intentional, I guess, ways in which um, my, our healthcare providers thought to include my husband in, in our care. And um, I just love some of your strategies, even that, that invitation piece, you know, often fathers who are working may think that, you know, it's, it's harder to include them, but, but, you know, I'm reflecting on a situation where we, they suggested to us, like on this visit, this might be a great day for your husband to be there. Um, so we had lots of upfront knowledge about what visit they were referring to and when he could plan to make sure that he wasn't going to be working that day. So a simple thing, but it was, it was really a, a warm invitation for him to feel included in that process. So thank you. And, and Sonia, thank you for saying that. Cause I, I really think too, that so much of our practice, it is these, it is these small, but simple things that really make a huge difference. And that's another great example of anticipatory guidance, right? On our next home visit, or is there a home visit where it would be good for your partner to be present? And what are those questions, right? So, but that requires purposeful action on our part as nurse, home visitor, midwife. Um, so thank you for sharing that example. I think that's a brilliant strategy. Thank you. Um, so we have a comment in the in the Q&A and everyone, please feel free to use the um, to enter your questions into the Q&A pod if you've not already had an opportunity to do so. Um, we have a comment about multicultural families where language may be a barrier during home visiting and where the presence of an interpreter um, may increase comfortability for fathers who are attending the visit. Just wondering if you're aware of any research or um, information related to fathers engagement and use of interpreters. Yeah, I'm, I, I have not I have not looked at that literature. So I'll just speak from um, experience, um, anecdotally working with public health nurses, working in public health, um, and also coming um, from a safety lens. Um, I, th I think it's important and I would I, 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 I would understand and, and suspect um, that most public health units uh, do have contracts with professional, um, interpreter services. And if that one is, um, if that's important to have, because sometimes we hear that families, um, partners or children are put into the role of interpreter, the value of a professional interpreter service is that everyone can engage as a recipient of service and they're not taking on a dual role. Um, when in working with interpreters, I think a clinician is always doing an assessment as well as thinking about um, are there options for gender of interpreter um, in early research that we did around screening for intimate partner violence in the first postpartum home visits offered by public health. Um, we learned from nurses that um, even with an interpreter there's certain topics that. Um, they often lack confidence to ask about, whether it's about safety and relationships, um, talking about contraception, um, and that certainly the confidence in doing that increased if the interpreter was a female interpreter. So looking at, you know, I think cultural norms, issues related to gender, sense of safety, right? So if the client in the home visiting program is, is a mother or identifies as female, what is their sense of comfort as well in, in having a male or female interpreter? Um, but I think if there are opportunities and flexibility, because I know sometimes we don't we don't have choice, we don't have choice of who's the interpreter or who's there. But in an ideal situation, if there are opportunities um, to indicate to a father that again on a future home visit, this might be an opportunity to ask your questions, have some of your concerns identified, and ask if we are able to get a professional interpreter, would you feel more comfortable if it's a male interpreter or a female one? And if those options are available, um, then I think then I think that's great, right? So it's always exploring what are the family's needs, what is their sense of confidence? Um, and that would show to a father that they're, you know, if this conversation is going to be focused on his needs, his concerns, if he's more comfortable having the father, you're comfortable as the service provider navigating and managing different power dynamics uh, within a relationship, then I think that's a, a great idea. 
And again, I think about too, I mean, the work of home visiting and community-based care is complex because you're always assessing and trying to understand and respond to so many diverse home environments that are influenced by different social norms, cultural norms, gender norms, power hierarchies. Um, so I appreciate that you're always sensitively um, walking through that. And again, I think back to the examples that I shared of that we always do need to be open that if we walk into a home and we feel that resistance or defensiveness from the father in some homes, that we don't take that personally or we don't give up, that we really use our motivational interviewing skills um, or our assessment skills or just be non judgmental and take some time to get to know them and to understand what is that source of defensiveness, resistance, hesitancy, because many times it will be grounded on that their needs have been dismissed. They haven't been acknowledged. Maybe they've come from another context or setting where having someone from an agency come into their home has not resulted in positive outcomes um, where they've experienced harms in different settings. Um, themselves. So we really do need to take the time to listen and understand when we're seeing that. Thank you, Susan. The next question I have for you is, would prenatal classes be a great time to engage with dads and an opportunity to make them feel like a priority in the family unit and their importance? A hundred percent, yes. If anyone is still doing in-person mm -hmm. um, or even virtual or hybrid uh, prenatal classes, I would say a absolutely. And does your curriculum include content about the roles of the two individuals um, or three individuals, whoever comes to the uh, prenatal classes? Um, I haven't looked at, um, I know many health units are using some online um, prenatal class programming, and I haven't seen the curriculum, um, but I'd be curious to see, does it include focused curriculum on transition to parenthood, unique transition um, to the role of fathering or becoming a partner? Because I think those experiences of transitioning in role from being not a parent to a parent, all of um, that process is influenced, of course, in how we were raised, how we were parented, our own cultural social norms. And if there's decisions to be made around infant feeding, how we're going to be parenting, what are our goals of parenting? Often those conversations are starting and those decisions are being made in the prenatal period. So if we as service providers have opportunities to engage with individuals, um, during that prenatal period, ab absolutely. I would suggest that there's curriculum, content, resources, opportunities to open up the conversation with fathers around what, do you, what are your expectations? What do you think this experience is going to be like? What are you excited about? What are your concerns? Um, again, the value of even doing a life history timeline in pregnancy with a father allows you to see what has happened um, in his childhood and how he was parented, and then to be able to start to set some goals, right? So um, asking them to reflect on their timeline and say, when you think back on how you were parented, what are some of the things that you want to emulate and build on? What are the strengths you want to build, build on? Or it, when how you were parented, are there any practices that the people that cared for you or parented you engaged in that you that you want to change or do differently? And what are those goals? And how as a home visitor do we support you to achieve those goals? So 100% yes. <laughs> Thanks, Susan. And would you have any specific recommendations about engaging fathers during discussions about breastfeeding or at breastfeeding clinics? Uh, again, um, and again, this might be my Pollyanna <laughs> world, but I would say ab ab absolutely. If, in, um, if, if you have a father present during a home visit or at a breastfeeding clinic um, and and you have checked in or assessed and again i'm always balancing um, being mindful of the type of engagement of the father because and many of you will know that I, that i've done a lot of work in the area of, of intimate partner violence so once you've done your assessment like is is mother feeling safe for this person to be engaged uh, do you have consent that everyone is there that you know that this is someone who you're sensing is in those top two you know that they're engaged and present and that it's safe um 
then I think it's just, you know, it's the, the yes, engage them if everyone feels safe in, in um, the breastfeeding conversations. And, you know, um, there's a lot of power in, in open ended questions. And just, you know, if the father's sitting there in a clinic or a home visit, asking, um, help me to understand what you know about breastfeeding. Um, what are your experiences being around individuals who are breastfeeding? Um, do, you know, have you thought about some of the ways as a father that you can be involved in supporting infant nutrition um, while they're being uh, breastfed? Um, you know, so thinking about, because I think for many fathers, they might feel that that's something that's just so, and it is so personal to the mother and an activity they can only engage in, but how else can they support um, around that? I knew, I knew in our household, once we had these twins, you know, breastfeeding on demand every three hours, my husband was getting up and he would have the diapers prepared. He would have the pillows prepared. So finding different ways to be involved. So I think the power of open-ended questions assessing safety, exploring their expectations, uh, because sometimes too, you'll start to see that between partners, there might be different expectations between the mother and father. And again, I know I'm using very traditional language, um, but that is the focus of today's webinar. There might be very different expectations around um, how long breastfeeding should occur, um, for how many months, um, you know, whose, whose breasts do these belong to, you know, as the partner starting to feel some jealousy, um, these issues occur. So I think, you know, very carefully assessing expectations, experiences, and when there, you know, might be places for conflict to opening up those conversations. Thanks, Susan. Now, the um, question about the Canada Prenatal Nutrition Program not sure you probably know more about that program than I do but should should that program include fathers oh my gosh um oh okay you know what I so I I I, I don't I don't know I don't know the answer to the that question because um I don't know enough about how the CPNP program is uniquely delivered um by community health centers or by the 34 public health units. I think initially, like many programs, um, the CPNP, Canadian Prenatal Nutrition Program, was initially developed um, to identify individuals um, at risk in pregnancy and as a way of engaging them in services, providing supports and services through um, vouchers, coupons, vitamins um, to promote pregnancy outcomes. Um, so I, I'm not sure if, if the outcomes of that program have changed, um, because sometimes programs are very focused on a very specific population to achieve specific outcomes. So improving um, engagement in services and prenatal um, outcomes. But so I won't speak to the program specifically because I don't know what are their modern um, core components. But I would think that at any time, if a partner shows up in a community organization, whether it's a community health center, um, a well baby clinic, an early on center, um, that if there is another partner there or a father there, um, that it is just best practice or good care to engage them, um, as, you know, always assess for safety, have that safety lens on. Um, and to ask them, what are your concerns? What are your needs? What's going to be your role? Um, because I think if there's, if we don't engage them, then we're just contributing um, to a history of many fathers or individuals having negative experiences or not having um, within the healthcare setting or not having their experiences heard or validated. Thank you. Um, we're seeing a couple of comments here about division of labor and tasks in the household, possibly where a mother is feeling she needs to micromanage um, all of the activities. Can you recommend any resources or tools for supporting um, parents in problem solving around managing each person's needs in the parenting role and division of tasks in the household? Yeah. Okay. Boy, that's okay. That could be a whole other webinar because that's complex again. And so we'll all acknowledge that roles of people in household are influenced again on our own history, social norms, cultural norms, expectations, power dynamics in the relationship. And um, um, what, what would I recommend? 
Um, I think careful assessment. So if you're in a long term home visiting program or have opportunities for long term engagement with families. Um, and, and sorry, I'm going to say this again, I really see that there's such value in starting early on in the home visits doing a life history timeline. And again, having the mother and father document sort of, you know, um, what were the most important events in their life, who supported them, how were they parented, what did their life look like from the time they were born to the time of that first home visit. Because as a nurse, it starts to give me a lot of information um, about um, how they were parented, what are some of their social norms and values. So that starts to give me some initial assessment information to understand where they're coming from. I think if you develop facilitators or resources or even just have open ended questions where there's an opportunity if there's a joint visit to really start to put out into the open. Um, what are everyone's expectations of themselves in their role and what are the expectations of the other person. I think in many relationships we just assume that our partner has the same values and beliefs and experiences as us and they're going to do it the way that we want it want to do it. And I know, again, just even in our own household, particularly when my teens became when my kids became teenagers, there were often times where my husband and I would look at each other and go, oh, we have really different ways that we're going to solve this issue. You know, I'm thinking of a time when, um, you know, a 14 year old was like, can I have two cans of beer to go to a party? And we would have to go up and uh, talk about it ourselves and come back on a united front. Um, so I think we need to acknowledge that in relationships that sometimes people um, have not talked about what are their expectations, what are their norms, so can we create opportunities for people to share without judgment, okay, you know we're going to be talking about toddler discipline. How were you disciplined at our child? What are your approaches to discipline? Um, what do both of you think about that? How do we come to some common ground? And my role as a nurse or a service provider is to share information about, you know, the safest way to discipline, um, you know, about best parenting, best parenting practices. Um, so open conversation, assessment, open conversation. And also, um, I do like to use both the power and control and equality wheel. Um, and I often use those two wheels, they're publicly available, to initiate conversations around um, healthy and unhealthy relationships. I would do those two wheels, though, first alone with a woman or the mother, um, just to begin to understand what are the characteristics of their relationship, and are there any elements of um, power and control um, in the relationship. So those would be two tools that I would use alone with a mother first to start to understand, because if there is power and course of control being used in the relationship, then my interventions as a nurse will take a very different direction as I begin to think about how to respond and address um, intimate partner violence within a relationship. Okay, Sonia, I see the time and I know we're, so I'll be quiet. I'll turn it back to you. <laughs> Thank you so much. I know we could probably continue talking more about this. There was a question about um, life history timelines. They are, if someone wants to maybe pop that in, actually, I'll quickly do it. I'm going to pop it into the uh, Q&A answer. <laughs> we have a previous webinar that um, that addressed that, that was actually also done by Dr. Jack. Um, so as we wrap up today's webinar, and uh, we want to thank um, Susan for presenting today and Monica Nunes for co-moderating with me. I wanna thank everyone who joined us for today's PHO webinar. You can expect to receive a brief and anonymous survey for today's session. So please try to complete this to help um, PHO improve their programming. A couple of reminders, as Susan mentioned, the next PHN prep webinar is scheduled for Wednesday, October the 18th, 9.30 to 10.30, where you'll hear Dr. Hil Hillary Brown speak about supporting parents with disabilities. Another um, reminder for everyone to save the date for the TOPHC, the Ontario Public Health Convention, which will be held on March 26th and April 3rd in 2024, and which is now accepting abstract submissions for the program. You can check out tophc.ca for details. Um, lastly, to access past presentations and view confirmed upcoming sessions, please visit the PHO website, head to education and events, and click on presentations. Thank you, everyone, and have a wonderful day.